Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh <laughs> Good afternoon everyone Thank you very much for coming to the second guest lecture about in maternity nursing um, Welcome <laughs> Dr. Siti Roshaidai We met again at the second guest lecture um, Hopefully that you have a great day today So how are you? Alright, Alhamdulillah, thank you <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, everyone. Uh, today we're gonna have a guest lecture in maternity nursing uh, with the topic pregnancy, fetus development, and culture in maternity nursing. So if you have any, so if you have any question to Dr. Sitaraj today, you can save it to the last session of this, this of the discussion and then the room chat uh, meeting chat uh, di zoom meeting ini sudah saya kirim link untuk daftar hadir silakan nanti diisi ya teman-teman gitu so dr sit are you ready for giving the material yeah i'm all right <laughs> right so um, dr sit the time is yours right um thank you so much uh miss chaperson so <laughs> We see again um, today after our last meeting on what day is that? Is it on um, Wednesday, right? Uh, Wednesday. Uh, Thursday. On Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Is it yesterday? Today. Today is before. Yeah, a day before. Yes. Yeah. Right. So um, we have been discussing um, regarding the trends and issue in nursing in the previous lecture. Um, so today I have seen that the attendance is not that many as compared to the previous one. Um, not sure whether you have um, overlap schedule or is there, I mean, uh, in terms of reduction number of the students uh, in this course, well, not sure. Actually, uh, I, I guess maybe they are watching from uh, YouTube because we are also live streaming on YouTube. So I guess they are watching there. Okay, 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 good, good. Um, okay, good then. So um, today, basically, we are going to um, um, understand further um, regarding the real or the reality of maternity nursing. So our topic today is regarding the pregnancy, um, regarding how fetus as well as the placenta is developed. Um, and a bit, uh, we're going to touch on the culture in maternity nursing. So these are the topics given to me, uh, pregnancy, fetal development, and culture in maternity nursing. However, I'm not going to cover that much on the cultural 
um, uh, area as we already talked a lot uh, in the previous lecture, but I'm going to touch a little bit um, only about the culture in maternity nursing. So, um, so I divided this lecture into um, three areas. So as you can see here, um, we have pregnancy, we have uh, fetal development. We're going to discuss fetal development after that. And at the end, at the end of this um, lecture, I will discuss about the culture in maternity nursing. So first of all, let us proceed to the first one, which is pregnancy. Yeah. Um, yeah, in a general term, when I ask you what is pregnancy, of course, you know what is pregnancy. Being pregnant, meaning you are carrying another life in your, in your body. Of course, we are talking about the women's, um, in women's body, even though we already learned in the last um, lecture uh, regarding male also can get pregnant. I mean, the transgender male, they can get pregnant as well. But normally, when we talk about the nurse, uh, talk about the pregnancy, it refers to a woman who carry another life inside their womb. So, how long it is? It can be, it can be seven months, it can be eight months. But normally, it will take about nine months for the pregnancy to be terminated or to be end. Um, but pregnancy is just not about carrying another life inside your body, but also when you cry, carry another life inside your body, there is also other changes happens to yourself. Okay, There are lots of changes. It's not only plainly about the uterus, but the baby itself. But there is um, a lots of adaptations that the woman might have in terms of the anatomy, in terms of the physiological changes as well as um, the biochemistry changes. So um, these all changes will together will bring about um, uh, the changes inside the woman's body system. So talking about the reproductive system itself, we can divide the reproductive system into, um, you can say four, you can say five in some books. Yeah, breast is not considered as one of the reproductive system. But yes, breast involved uh, in terms of the changes that the woman had throughout the throughout the pregnancy, right? So if you're talking only about the reproductive system here, we're talking about uterus, we're talking about the cervix, we're talking about the vagina, as well as the ovary. But we include breast because breast is important for the woman, especially during the lactation period, where the woman need to give the breastfeeding after the childbirth, right? So let's us go one by one. We're going to move to the uterus first. So as you might know, you have learned in your first year, I guess, uh, regarding the anatomy, physiology of, um, of the woman and as well as the male. But now we're focusing, of course, the uterus. Yes, uterus only belongs to women. None of the men, of course, have uterus. So we have uh, three layers of the uterus, right? So the outside layer, we call it perimetrium. Okay, the, this one. Can you see my cursor? Right, so you can see the outer layer here, uh, we call it perimetrium. Okay, so this layer is so important to differentiate um, the, the uterine cavity and the peritoneum cavity. So um, the muscles, so here is the muscles, we call it myometrium. So the myometrium is so important during uh, the childbirth process itself, of course, for the contraction to happen so that the woman can have um, a good progress in labor, therefore she can deliver the baby very well. And the myometrium also important after the childbirth where the myometrium need to be contracted and retracted in order to stop the bleeding for, for some women or to reduce the risk of bleeding for, for the woman after childbirth. And the most inside one, we call it endometrium. So endometrium layer is so important for the placenta to, to be implanted. Right, so that the fetus or the baby can get um, nutrients from the mother through the placenta as well as through the cord. Right, um, so now let us see the structure of the anatomy, okay, the structure or the anatomy of the uterus. So the shape of the uterus, we call it antiversion or anti, anti, antiflexion. So what is what does it mean? It means that the uterus condition, it does not stand um, like a straight position. 
it seems like a um, bending position, something like if you bend your body, something like that, a little bit down. That one, we call it um, a flexion, okay? moving downward like that. So in non-pregnancy state, the weight of the uterus is about 60 grams. And throughout the, uh, I mean, until towards the end of the pregnancy, the weight of the uterus can goes up to one kilogram or 900 grams. So it's 15 times bigger than the original size or bigger than the non-pregnancy state. Yeah. So um, throughout the pregnancy, the uterus will have, uh, the uterus will, will be enlarged and uh, there is uh, the process known as hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the my myometrium. That means that the, the muscles of the myometrium are now increased in terms of the size uh, and the cells so that it, it can grow and it can go bigger than uh, compared to the non-pregnancy state. Uh, the uterus also will be distended uh, during that's mean that the uterus is some sort of like a, it can uh, it can be extended it can be uh, it is elastic uh, so called so it can be um, extended so that it will allow the growth and development of the baby to take place. Um, other than that, there is a blood volume increase uh, inside the uterus throughout the pregnancy so that it will supply um, more food to the baby, can uh, sufficient food to the baby, as well as preparation for the uh, implantation of the placenta. Yeah? So when the placenta wants to secure at the endometrium layer, the blood volume, high blood volume is required. Okay? Other than that, you, the uterus might um, experience the painless contraction. This painless contraction, we call it Braxton Hicks. Right. So um, the mother, when uh, they are in labor, when they want to give birth to the baby, they will feel the painful contraction. But the Braxton Hicks that happens during the pregnancy is the painless. That means the mother won't feel pain uh, due to the Bra Bra Braxton Hicks. Yeah. So normally the mother might experience the Braxton Hicks contraction um, in the beginning of four months, as, as early as four months of the pregnancy. Right, um, so as you can see from this picture, yeah, uh, uh, A and B, the picture shows the growth of the uterus and fetus. So as you can see, normally um, during um, 20 weeks of the pregnancy or five months of the pregnancy, our landmark is the umbilical. So if you see the tummy of the pregnant mother at 20 weeks or five months, you can see the level of the uterus at, is at the umbilical line and it goes further and further when the pregnancy becomes more advanced, right? So here is the, again, the example or uh, the picture to explain how uh, the pregnancy progress and how the measurement of the uterus going to be increased. Yeah, so it's, it is started at 12 weeks of the pregnancy. Normally, during the 12 weeks of the pregnancy, now the baby um, are ready to go out from the um, pelvic cavity. So you know that the uterus is protected during the non-pregnancy state. The uterus. Uh, situated in the pelvic cavity or in the pelvic bones. So after 12 weeks of the pregnancy, because of the enlargement of the baby or the growth of the baby and the growth of the uterus itself, um, or the enlargement of the uterus itself makes the uterus come out from the original situation or from the original place. Now it comes out from the pelvic cavity and it goes up beyond to 20 weeks of the pregnancy. Now at this time, if you measure the, the abdominal for this mother, um, now you can see there is enlargement of the abdomen, which is, uh, I said just now, at the level of the umbilicus or you call it belly button. So you, you can measure it about 20 centimeters. So normally 20 centimeters is equal to 20 weeks of the pregnancy. Uh, plus minus yeah right and then um and it goes up more and more when the pregnancy more advanced as i said but you can see here when the pregnancy is 32 weeks it's here goes up to the near to the xiphot process 
at the 36th week of the pregnancy. But remember, it goes down when the pregnancy at 40 weeks. Why do you think it's happened? Okay, so it is happens because now the head of the baby already goes into the pelvic cavity, right? So the pelvic both uh, pelvic brims we call it. So now when the pel when the head of the baby already enter the pelvic brim or the pelvic uh, bones, yeah. So now uh, lift some space here. Therefore, when the mother is pregnant at forty weeks, you won't get the the measurement is 40 centimeter. You will get less than 40 centimeter due to the, what we call engagement of the fetal head, which is fetal head enter to the pelvic brim or the pelvic cavity. Right, um, so um, as I mentioned just now, there is three layers of the uterus. Um, the first one is the perimetrium, the outside one, the inter, I mean, uh, uh, in between, uh, the first and the third layer, we call it myometrium, contents of the muscles. And the most inside one is the endometrium. So before the pregnancy, um, we have three layers of the endometrium, what we call superficial layer, functional layer, and basal layer. However, during pregnancy or at the pregnancy, um, there will be transformation of the layers inside the endometrium. Right. So normally the first two layers, superficial layer and functional layer, they will be transformed into one that we call decidua. Okay, decidua consists of compact and cavernosus um, layer, whereas the basal layer does not change um, during the pregnancy. What is decidua actually? Decidua is so important um, in order to differentiate to the uh, trophoblast. What is the importance of the trophoblast? Trophoblast later on is going to develop the uh, or transform into the placenta, which is so important for the baby in order to have a secure place inside the mother's uterus or maternal uterus. Right. Um, yeah. So the second layer is the myometrium. So what is the function of the myometrium? Myometrium contains the muscles, of course. It is to accommodate the growing fetus um, in preparation for its role to expel the fetus or the baby and placenta during labor. How are they going to do that? Through the contraction and retraction through, uh, during the labor. So the muscle contract and retract. So they contract. Uh, and then they relax after that. So that's when we call it contraction and retraction of the myometrium. Um, this contraction and retraction also important in order to control uh, the bleeding after the delivery of the baby as well as delivery of the placenta, right? So the myometrium needs to be functioned very well. If the myometrium fail to contract and retract as it should be, then the bleeding might be occur for this mother. So the myometrium um, uh, is responsible in order to make sure there is an enlargement inside the uterus. And how they do that? Um, myometrium itself is going to grow during the pregnancy and it also become more stretched during the pregnancy. So myometrium is stretchable and they are growing through the pregnancy period. At the same time, the, the outer layer, we call it perimetrium just now. Uh, perimetrium also experience hypertrophies and also increase in the vascularity. Um, and this um, mechanism makes the um, uterus is lifting out outside the uh, pelvic bones during the pregnancy. Um, that's the first part of the uterus. Now we are going to move to the cervix. What happened? What are the changes experienced by the cervix during pregnancy? The first one is cervix now um, um, have more, uh, what we call it, uh, discharge. Yeah? Why do oh, cervix have more discharge? Because um, okay. this, due to the function or due to the increase of hormones called estrogen. So the increase of estrogen during pregnancy will stimulate the cervix to 
um, to this uh, to give more discharge or to to excrete more discharge during the pregnancy. What discharge? It's not ear discharge. It's talking about the vaginal discharge, right? So the discharge also contributed by the cervix. Yeah. So the cervix also more active during the pregnancy. Um, the endocervical glands uh, will secrete a thick and sticky mucus that accumulates and forms a plaque. If you can see from this figure, you can see the like a. Uh, uh, what color is that? The yellow, the light yellow color here. That one is the what we call mucus plug. So the mucus plug will remain here until the termination of the pregnancy. So once the mother gives birth to the baby, then the mucus plug will be um, uh, what we call, we will remove from the cervix. Yeah. So um, this one will be um, stay here, will stay here until the end of the pregnancy. And uterus also, uh, cervix also will increase uh, its vascularity. So there is a sign that we call Goodell signs and Catwick signs. What does it mean? Goodell signs is the softening of the cervix. So cervix becomes more soft. Eh? And also the color turns into blue. This one we call it, um, it's not really blue, but it's, we call it bluish discoloration. So these signs we call it Catwick signs. So these two signs, Goodell signs, and the Catwick sciences belongs to the cervix. Um, at the same time, uh, vagina also similar to the other structure or organ just now, vagina also experience hypertrophy and hypoplasia, meaning that the cells increase, the size of the vagina increase. So there is a thickening of the vaginal mucosa and there is also increased vaginal secretion. So that's why it is not that uncommon where you can see pregnant mother, normally they have more vaginal discharge during the pregnancy. This is due to the hypertrophy and hyperplasia or increase in cells and increase in size um, in the vagina. Uh, vagina also will increase its acidity so the pH of the vagina during the pregnancy is about 3.6 to 6.0. That's the pH of the vagina. Why they need to they need to be uh, become the acidity uh, in in this in this uh, situation or in this uh, time because um, the acidity environment is so important for the vagina to. Uh, interact with the uh, what is called dodelin bacilli. So the dodelin bacilli is to, uh, will produce more acidic environment at the vagina. And this will further um, reduce the risk for the mother to have any infection at the vagina. Yeah. Right. What happened to the ovary? Okay. So the ovary, of course, the ovary is no longer producing ovum, right? Or ova. The body no longer producing the eggs or the ovum. And this is due to the increase of estrogen and progesterone. So when the estrogen and progesterone increase during pregnancy, it will make um, uh, the ovary is no longer what we call um, a, a fertile or no longer producing the um, ovum. So we don't have any ovulation. This will explain why the mother during pregnancy, they don't have any menstrual cycle or menstrual period, right? So during the first three months of the pregnancy, the corpus luteum um, at the ovary will grow and enlarge. And uh, we also know that during pregnancy, that's one hormone, uh, we call it human chorionic gonadotropin. So this hormone, in short, we call it HCG. So you remember or not, if you see the video um, showing how happy they are when they receive the UPT test, the urine, urine pregnancy test, right? So the urine pregnancy test is actually get the two lines because of the increase in the human chorionic gonadotropin, which is known as HCG. So the HCG is increased for the mother during pregnancy. Um, and um, this, this is secreted by the trophoblast. Okay, the trophoblast, where is the trophoblast? Near to the placenta, of course, inside the uterus. Lah. And then um, this, with, uh, this uh, will augment okay, the action of the, what we call luteinizing hormones. That's why in the first, um, in the first uh, three months of the pregnancy, 
the corpus luteum will grow and enlarge. However, after three months of the pregnancy, the corpus luteum become regressed and becomes more smaller. Why it happens? Because at this time, uh, placenta already takes over the role of the trophoblast until the end of the pregnancy. So now we go to the breast. What happened to the breast? So the changes at the breast normally happens because of the hormonal imbalance, right? So um, the breast becomes more enlarged, more nodule. So the breast can be becomes bigger as well during the pregnancy. Uh, why it happens? Because the mother now want to prepare the breast or want to prepare themselves. Um, to the process of the lactation, which is breastfeeding the baby after the childbirth later on. Um, if you see the breast also, there is superficial veins uh, at the breast. So you can see the like a bluish in color on the breast become more prominent. And the nipples also becomes more erectile and we can see the layer uh, of the areola or the area surrounding the nipples, we call it areola, becomes more darkened. Um, of course, every woman, they have the, the areola, but during pregnancy, the areola become more darker. And then um, there is a, or the first, uh, what we call um, discharge from the breast, we call it colostrum. So you perhaps have heard about the word of colostrum. So colostrum is very high uh, in its, uh, what we call antibody, which is uh, very important for the baby in order to develop their immunity. Right, so the colostrum have um, lots of antibody. It is yellow in color. So we can also express the colostrum during pregnancy. Yeah, I mean, the colostrum can be expressed during the pregnancy. Right, so this is the picture showing you just now I mentioned about the areola. So this is the areola. Um, just now I said the nipple become more erectile. The areola become more darker here. And you can see the superficial... Uh, what we call superficial um, veins. Okay, the veins becomes more prominent on the breast, right? Okay, so if you compare before pregnancy and late pregnancy, you can see now there's lots of the alveoli um, at this stage, the color, the pink color, yeah? So the areola is very important in terms of um, becomes the sources or the, the, the space or the place where the breast milk will be stored. And this will be excreted through the nipple once the baby suck the breast later on. All right, so um, these are the changes um, during the pregnancy. In the beginning of the pregnancy, when the mother is now like a three to four months pregnant, the mother will feel the tingling sensation. What is tingling sensation? Tingling sensation is something like you feel someone prick your breast. Okay, so that's one is the tingling sensation. Um, if you have girls, I know that we have lots of girls in this group. You might have this tingling sensation as well before you have your menstrual period. So almost the similar um, sensation during the uh, in the beginning of the pregnancy, right? During six weeks of the pregnancy, the breast becomes more enlarged, more sensitive, and more tender. Uh, and during eight weeks, then we can see the veins uh, at the breast. And then we can also see the Montgomery tubercle more prominent. Uh, if you still remember the Montgomery tubercle, um, this one uh, is here. Yeah, It's a little bit small, small, uh, like a nodule uh, uh, surrounding the areola. So that one we call it Montgomery tubercle. Mm, and then um, uh, during 12 weeks of the pregnancy, there is areola pigmentation, uh, meaning that the, just now I mentioned areola becomes more darker. So we call it primary areola, right? Uh, during 16 weeks of the pregnancy, there will be another layer of the, it's not layer, like another, um, what we call darker color of the areola, we call it secondary areola. Uh, and, and this, and at this time, if the mother express um, the via breast, then the colostrum can be seen. Um, all right. 
So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, it, uh, the changes that the woman had is not only involved the reproductive system itself, but it also affected the whole body system, including respiratory, um, the urinary system, the cardiovascular system. So, one of the system affected by the pregnancy is respiratory system. What happens to the respiratory system? Now, um, the mother needs more oxygen uh, uh, because you know that um, the mother needs to share with the baby as well. So uh, the mother needs to maximize their uh, oxygen intake as well as to provide efficient carbon dioxide excretion to the mother and to the fetus. So you know that the baby is going to excrete their carbon dioxide from the uh, through the umbilical cord, goes to the placenta and goes to the maternal blood system. So basically, the mother and baby now they are sharing the um, the blood system. Okay, uh, so therefore there will be uh, more oxygen need to comes in and more carbon dioxide need to be excreted out. Yeah. And um, during the late of the pregnancy, at the end stage of the pregnancy or at the end trimester of the pregnancy, uterus becomes more enlarged. And at this time, the uterus will compress the diaphragm. If you remember, uh, the diaphragm is here. Here is the lungs, right? And here is the heart. So now, um, this one is the non-pregnancy stage. Um, the tummy is so slim, so nice, so beautiful but it's no longer become that slim um, until the end of the pregnancy. Now the mother, the, ma the, the baby growing up and then also the uterus enlarge. The enlargement of the uterus as well as the growing fetus will push out the diaphragm. So this will make a, a, a smaller space for the mother um, to breathe very well. So in this case, the mother might have shortness of breath during pregnancy or they need to breathe more. Uh, I mean, the respiration rate might be increased because they need to breathe more in order to take more oxygen to come in. Um, not only respiratory system are affected by the pregnancy, but heart also, what we call cardiovascular system, also affected by the pregnancy. What happens to the heart during pregnancy? So uh, during pregnancy, uh, the growing of the uterus may displace the heart upward and slightly to the left and rotate anterior, meaning during the pregnancy, the position of the heart might be displaced a little bit due to the enlargement of the uterus as well as the growing baby. Um, so the cardiac output also will increase from 5 liters per minute to 7 liters per minute by the late of the pregnancy. So we know that one of the changes during the pregnancy, um, the baby needs more, uh, the, the blood volume will increase, the baby needs more blood volume, and then um, the implantation of the placenta to the endometrium also needs more blood to come in. Therefore, uh, the heart of the mother needs to work more than usual, more than non-pregnancy states. So that's why the cardiac output will also increase per minute from 5 liter to 7 liter per minute by the end of the pregnancy. Um, in the blood system, uh, there's also the red blood cell, or we call it RBC, and the plasma volume will also increase. But um, it is common that we know during pregnancy, the increase of the plasma volume are more than RBC. Mm -hmm. uh, more than RBC. So that's why at this time, the pregnant mother, they are prone to get uh, anemia. Okay, if you still remember anemia, perhaps you have learned in your second year. So um, anemia is the condition where the RBC is lower um, than 12 or some would say uh, lower than 13. So it depends lah, normally less than 12 um, here in Malaysia. So um, so um, the hemoglobin will also, um, uh, sorry, I mentioned just now hemoglobin, I, I said RBC. So anemia is when the hemoglobin, yeah, hemoglobin is less than 12 gram uh, per, uh, for the pregnant mother. Um, and the hematocrit also will decrease and this will expose the mother to the anemia, of course, yeah. 
Uh, and at this time, the uh, white blood cell also increased. Why the mother needs more white blood cells? Because uh, it is the preparation for the defense mechanism. If let's say any infection occurs either to the mother or to the baby. Uh, the mother also will have more clothing, clothing factors uh, because uh, the clothing factors is important in terms of preventing the hemorrhage during the, uh, the labor process. Yeah. Um, right. Um, for the gastrointestinal tract, um, it's also affected by the increase of estrogen and progesterone. Remember earlier I said during the pregnancy, there is increase of the estrogen and progesterone. So the increase of the estrogen during the pregnancy makes the, our gums become more spongy. And therefore, if the mother brush teeth during the pregnancy, they tend to get bleeding when they're brushing their teeth because the, the gums becomes a little bit spongy. And then the mother also are prone to get gingivitis, the infection at the gums. Um, and uh, the increase of the progesterone will make uh, the muscle, the smooth muscles become more relaxed. And this will make uh, the gastric emptying and peristalsis becomes more, swole, uh, more slow. Eh? Slower becomes more slower. And the mother might also have the gastric reflux. So they might have gastric, uh, what we call epigastric pain, for example, because of the relaxation of the smooth muscles in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and because the peristalsis becomes more small, more slower, then um, lots of the water will be absorbed into the cells, into the body cells. Therefore, the stools become more harder. Um, therefore, the mother might have constipation during pregnancy. Uh, for the urinary system, um, we know that um, the uterus, the enlargement of the uterus will compress on the bladder. So the uterus does not only um, I don't know whether I have the picture here. No, I don't have the picture, but I want to show to you how the enlargement. So here is the uterus and just down here, we have the bladder. Can we see the bladder? No, we cannot see properly. Oh, yes, yes, here. The yellow one is the bladder, yeah? So the yellow one is the bladder and you can see when the, when the fetus grow and when the uterus becomes more enlarged, then it will compress the um, urinary system or press, compress the bladder. So during pregnancy, um, the uterus will compress the bladder, therefore the mother might have frequency of the menstruation. So the mother will go to the toilet more, they want to pee more. Uh, so this is caused by the compression of the bladder. Normally the symptoms will be, uh, uh, will be more uh, prevalent or more frequent during the first trimester okay, and also during the third trimester. So uh, due to the progesterone uh, increase, then I said just now, the smooth muscle um, becomes more um, softened, uh, including the smooth muscle at the renal pelvis, at the ureters, uh, and it becomes relaxed and dilate, um, and, and dilatation also might occur. And this will increase um, uh, the risk of the urinary tract infection for the mother. So in this case, the mother might have the burning sensation when they want to pee. So they're quite painful during their um, mixturation process. At the same time, inside the kidney, the glomerular filtration rate, or we call it GFR, glomerular filtration rate also will increase up to 50 um, 50 uh, percent. And this will make uh, the what we call uh, the big molecule can pass through the uh, renal system. So the mother might have glycosuria. What is glycosuria? The presence of the sugar inside the urine. Yeah. For the integumentary system, the changes at the integumentary system again caused by the um, hormonal imbalance. Um, and now the breast uh, might also have the pigmentation. Um, just now we talked about the areola pigmentation. And there will be also uh, at the abdomen, we have the linear nigra. So I will show to you uh, later about the linear nigra. I will show the picture to you. And um, there's also changes at the maternal vulva um, and also at the face, we call it colosma. So I will show the picture to you after this, don't worry. 
And uh, there's also um, other changes. We'll call it strae gravidarum. So the strae gravidarum is the what we call it um, the stretch mark. Eh? The stretch mark during the pregnancy. It can be at the abdomen, at the at the breast, at the buttock, as well as the at the thigh. So normally, the strae gravidarum will stay with the woman throughout the pregnancy and after one year of childbirth. So normally, it will disappear after one year, or it might not be disappear at all until the the end of their life. Eh? But in general, it will disappear after one year. So just now I mentioned about linear nigra. So this picture shows the linear nigra. I believe that you all girls, you can go back and check whether or not you have linear nigra. So normally every one of us, the girls, I don't know if boys also have the linear nigra, I'm not that sure. So normally um, we have the linear nigra, but normally it is not that prominent before the pregnancy. If you are not pregnant, the linear nigra is not that prominent. But during the pregnancy, the linear nigra is really prominent. It can be like only this line or it can go up uh, to here. Nah? So it depends on, on the, the original version. Nah? Yeah? Uh, but this one, we call it linear nigra. It is very prominent. It can be seen during, during the abdominal assessment or abdominal examination. Um, right, so just now I mentioned about the strae gravidarum. I said the strae gravidarum can be at the abdomen, can be at the thigh, at the buttock. So um, this one is the strae gravidarum, or you call it stretch mark yeah, during pregnancy. Um, this is the vascular spider, spider. You can see from here, this one is the vascular spider. This is not, this is the changes that requires no treatment, but this is the the example of the integumentary system changes during the pregnancy. And this one is the, what we call it, prurigon. So uh, this one is the abnormal state, lah. abnormal uh, things happen where the mother might have um, itchiness at their tummy or at their abdomen area. So this one needs to be treated with a certain type of the medication. Uh, this one also abnormal, we call it go herpetiformis, and this one is pemphigot gestation. This one both are abnormal. No? Right, so um, the, in the endocrine system also, we know that we've been talking about lots of hormones during pregnancy. So one of the system um, responsible for the hormonal imbalance during pregnancy is the endocrine system. So we know that during pregnancy, the placenta itself, the existence of the placenta itself will contribute to the chaos happens to the body because the placenta, it is not only to um, give food or give nutrients to the baby uh, and, and functioning in terms of um, uh, exchange, the, the, what we call the gas exchange between the baby and the mother. But the placenta also release uh, certain hormones, and this placenta release uh, release hormones that we call human placenta lactogen or HPL, human pla uh, human um, placenta lactogen, and the second one is the human chorionic chorionic gonadotrophin, human chorionic gonadotrophin. This one is the hormone um, detected by the UPT just now, the by the urine pregnancy test, and as I mentioned just now. And the placenta also will release the hormones um, known as estrogen and progesterone. Um, at the P23 gland, um, it's also uh, preparing uh, for the delivery process and uh, releasing the hormones known as oxytocin and another hormones that is um, uh, what we call important for the lactation period at all, known as prolactin. The other hormone like melanocyte hormone is, will, will affect uh, in terms of the integumentary changes as I mentioned just now. Um, in the skeletal system, um, you know, uh, again, the function of the progesterone uh, during pregnancy, of course, we've been talking uh, about the estrogen and progesterone, and we know that the estrogen, uh, the, the increase of the progesterone will cause the relaxation of the ligaments and muscles inside the woman's body. And this will allow the pelvis to increase its capacity, so meaning that the the pelvis now trying to stretch its capacity to make sure the baby have enough space to stay in. 
Um, at the same time, the symphysis pubis and the sacroiliac joints also becomes more softened and um, the joints known as uh, sacrococcygeal joints become more loosened to allow coccyx to, to, uh, to go to, back, to backwards. Uh, that means, again, it is to allow enough space or sufficient space for the baby to stay inside the maternal um, uterus or maternal uh, tummy. Um, and you can see the position of between the non-pregnant mother and the pregnant mother. So here is the non-pregnant mother. You can see this one is the shape of the spines, right? And then if you can see um, the shape of the spines for the pregnant mother, it becomes the lower spines curve inward. That means the spines a little bit go inward like that. So this one is resulted by the softening uh, of the bones that resulted by the increase of the progesterone. So we know also the mother, of course, during pregnancy, their weight will increase. So their weight increase, why? Because um, the baby now growing up, uh, they themselves also growing up, and uh, the uterus, the myometrium also growing up or extended, um, therefore the maternal will have more weight. Yeah. So um, there are the other factors that will contribute to the weight uh, or weight gain during pregnancy, which include maternal edema. I believe that you know what is edema when the, or the fluid accumulation inside the body, right? So if the mother has edema, then the, the, their body weight might be increased during pregnancy. Um, uh, if the metabolic rate become reduced, then it also will increase the weight gain. If the dietary intake, if the mother eats more, then of course, um, it will also increase their body weight. But at the same time, there's a lot of mother who might not be able to tolerate food, especially during the first, um, during the first uh, few months of the pregnancy due to, their, due to the morning sickness, where they have nausea, they have vomiting a lot, so they cannot tolerate food. Uh, right? So that one will cause the maternal weight to reduce. Lah. Um, the vomiting or diarrhea, yes, if the mother has lots of vomiting, have diarrhea, of course, it will reduce the weight. If the mother smoking, uh, yes, because smoking can, um, what we call, can result uh, in low birth weight of the baby. Yeah? So can affect uh, low birth weight of the baby, the baby become more smaller than, than what we expected. Uh, the amount of amniotic fluid, if the mother have lots of the amniotic fluid inside their body, of course, their weight also will increase. And the size of the fetus, whether the mother uh, being pregnant to the twin pregnancy, of course, their weight gain will be, uh, will be increased as compared to the mother who only have one baby inside. So what more if the mother pregnant for three babies or four babies inside their tummy, of course, the weight will be uh, more higher. Lah. So um, the recommended weight gain for the pregnant mother during the pregnancy is about 10 kilogram until 12.5 kilogram throughout the pregnancy, the total weight gain, not per month. Yeah? Um, so 10 to 12.5 uh, kilogram per pregnancy. So within nine months or 40 weeks, we expect that the weight of the mother um, uh, 10 to 12.5, uh, the, the, the weight increase and the weight gain. Right, so for example, if now uh, your weight is 40 kilogram, so perhaps during your pregnancy later on, your weight can go up to 50 or 52.5 kilogram. So um, if we, we see the gestation, if let's say before 20 weeks of the pregnancy, uh, we estimate that the mother will gain their weight uh, 0 0.5 kilogram per month, okay, per month. But after 20 weeks of the pregnancy, we expect that they gain weight more than that, which is about 2 kilogram per month or 0 0.5 kilogram per week. Yeah. Right. So now um, we finish with the changes that the woman might have uh, during pregnancy. Now we go to the signs and symptoms of the pregnancy. Um, this these signs and symptoms can be divided into three, which is presumptive signs, probable signs, and positive signs. What does it mean for this presumptive, probable, positive? Let's go one by one. So what is the presumptive sign? So presumptive signs is the changes uh, that are experienced and reported by the 
client okay for example the woman might come and reported that they don't they no longer have the menstrual period or we call it amenorrhea so no longer having period or the mother might also come um, complaining of nausea and vomiting so they they just get married and started to get vomit a lot okay they have the nausea so this one can be uh, can be a uh, signs of the pregnancy and they might also have a frequent urination they go to the toilet quite many times because they want to pee so that's the changes that the mother might have um, and breast changes uh the, yeah like i mentioned just now they might have tingling sensation they might have the areola changes the breast changes um, they might have excessive vaginal discharge so there is there is uh, vaginal changes they might have quickening. What is quickening? Quickening is the first movement of the baby inside the uterus that can be felt by the mother. Okay, so it can be felt by the mother. This one we call it quickening. The first movement of the baby inside the maternal uterus. And the mother might also have skin changes and becomes more fatigued, like easily get tired. Um, or excessive tired. So the presumptive signs is not the confirmation that you are pregnant. So for example, if you get married, ne uh, get married next month and then you started to have nausea and vomiting, you might say, okay, I'm pregnant. And you go to the clinic and the doctor check, check and then um, it's not pregnancy. It's due to the GIT problems or the gastrointestinal problem. You might have eating the um, uh, uh, quite spicy food, for example, that's why you have nausea and vomiting or you have diarrhea, for example. Um, so amenorrhea can also be associated with the other condition, like uh, um, other problems uh, in terms of the gynecological problems, or you can be stressed, okay? I, I don't know whether you experience this, but lots of girls who have stress doing the assignments, for example, and they find out or suddenly they don't have a period at that month so the this uh, the period is skipped for that month and only next month uh, she will have another period that comes in so amenorrhea not only caused by the pregnancy but also affected by the psychological changes that the mother might have the frequency menstruation or the frequency urination why it is not confirmed that you are pregnant because it can also be associated with other conditions such as urinary tract infection or any renal changes for example Right. Okay. Uh, now the second changes that we uh, the second signs of the pregnancy we call it probable signs. So what is probable signs? Probable signs of the pregnancy are those signs commonly noted by physician upon examination of the patient. So just now we know the presumptive signs is the signs that the mother report to you, like the mother say, oh I, I have nausea, I have vomiting a lot, and then I don't have any period this month, um, or I, I go to the toilet quite frequent this is what the mother tell you what the mother report to you but the probable signs is the signs that we as a nurse check and we find out okay this is the changes that the mother had so um, these probable signs can include uh, uterine changes why we didn't say that uterine changes is confirmed that you are pregnant because there's lots of other um, other abnormalities uh, or other pathological condition that leads to the uterine changes for example, if the mother have um, like a molar pregnancy or if the mother have the gynecological problems and this makes the endometrium become more, what we call more thicker. Okay, for example, if the mother have fibroid, uh, so this one also can result to the uterine changes. So probable signs of the pregnancy, we cannot confirm, okay, now if you have uterine changes, you are pregnant. No, we cannot say it like that. In fact, if we go and check the abdomen, now the abdomen become en enlarged. So the, uh, there is changes inside the, uh, in terms of the abdomen, but we cannot confirm that you are pregnant because the abdominal changes can also result by the other conditions such as fibroid just now or cancer, for example. And cervical changes also is not the confirm that you are pregnant because it can be related to other pathological condition or other disease, like if you are having cervix uh, cancer, right? So it can also having the um, uh, related to the cervical changes. The positive 
uh, pregnancy test by the physician. Okay, so now you see that if you see in online, you see in the YouTube, you will see um, a happy pregnant couple showing two lines of their urine pregnancy test, uh, showing that they're pregnant. But again, uh, if uh, that's the only signs of the pregnancy, you might want to check further because this one cannot confirm that you're pregnant. The positive pregnancy, pregnancy test can also be associated with other problems, yeah, like a molar pregnancy. In molar pregnancy, the mother is not really pregnant for the baby. Instead, there is an abnormal condition of the um, of the uh, inside the uterus, yeah, molar pregnancy. Um, and then uh, fetal palpation. In fact, if the the physician or the nurse palpate, they can feel the the what we call the part or the limbs, it might not be uh, true. So we cannot confirm. So we need to double, always double check with the ultrasound. So these probable signs or the presumptive signs is perhaps uh, we can say, okay, possible do, that you are pregnant, but we cannot confirm that you are pregnant until we do the positive signs or we check for the positive signs. So how do we confirm that the mother Pregnant. So the first one that we can do, of course, the ultrasounds, uh, ultrasound scanning of the fetus. If we do the ultrasound and we can see the um, what we call the, the baby sac or we can see the heartbeat, uh, then only we can confirm, okay, confirm that you are pregnant. Or you can do x-ray, but this one is, is not allowed during pregnancy. Lah. Of course, if you are pregnant, we are not, we are not allowed you to go and check for x-ray. And then other than that, we can also do the palpation of the entire uterus, uh, entire fetus. That means that you go and check and you can feel the fetal part, like uh, where's the fetal head, where's the fetal back, where is the fetal limbs, the legs, the hands. If we can palpate all of that, then this one can be the positive signs of the pregnancy. And again, just now I mentioned to you about the fetal heart sounds. If you go the, do the ultrasound and you can hear the fetal heart rate or hear the fetal heart sounds, then yeah, okay, confirm that you are pregnant. Okay, we finished with the first part. Uh, the first part, should I continue or do you need a break? You need a break? Boleh, Jer? Uh, just go ahead. Uh, yeah, I can continue, yeah? Uh, normally, my students, they need a break. Uh, so that's why I always ask. Uh, okay, so um, if you don't need a break, then uh, we move to the second part of our lecture today. So just now, um, I have spoken about the pregnancy. So now we are going to move a little bit about the fetal development, yeah? Right, so um, for the fetal development, actually, um, um, those Muslims in this class, you might see lots of um, verse in the Quran talking about the human creation. Um, but this one, um, Surah Al Mu'minun, this one is quite interesting where um, um, Allah ex uh, explained to us about the creation of the human being. Yeah, so we can see the translation. I know all of you can read this one. But let us see now the translation Allah uh, said in the Quran. They said they created, we created man um, out of extract of clay that is water and earth. Uh, that means the creation of Adam, um, the first prophet. And therefore, or the first human being, thereafter we made him the offspring of Adam as a nutfah. So if you, if you recite Surah Yasin, also talking about uh, nutfah, uh, what is nutfah? Nutfah is the mixed drops of the male and the female sexual discharge, which is the sperms and the ovum, right? And then we lodge it in a safe lodging. Safe lodging, that is the womb of the woman, or we have seen just now, the, the uterus of the woman. Then we made the nutfah into a clot, uh, and what is clot? A piece of thick coagulated blood. Then we made into we made the clot into a little lump of flesh, and then we drew flesh outside there. And then we made out of the lump of flesh bones, and we clothed the bones with flesh. Then we brought it to forth, uh, it forth as another creation that is human being. So Allah said, "Be blessed, be Allah. So blessed be Allah, the best of creator. And after that, surely you will die, and again, surely." 
you will be resurrected on the day of the resurrections. Yeah. So that's how Allah explained in detail to us about the human creation. So now let's have a look from the scientific point of view, um, how the creation of the human started from um, uh, the, the fusion between ovums and sperm. Um, I believe that you have learned in your first year regarding this anatomy, regarding the human fertilization. So basically, it's just like a revision for you, I believe. Yeah. So this one is the sperms or the spermatozoon. And here you have the corona radiator. You have a corona radiator outside here. And then um, here you have the zona pellucida, the, the pink color. And then you have the cytoplasm um, of the oocyte inside. So basically this one is the ovums and sperms comes in. Uh, lots of sperms will come for one ovum, yeah? Mm. Right, so what happens? Um, what happens during the, what is the process of the human fertilization, yeah? Right. Uh, so uh, during ovulation, uh, during ovulation, um, the uh, the ovary will release ovum, and this ovum will transfer or will move towards the uterine tube, or you might call it fallopian tube. And then at the same time, um, the cervix of the the female cervix, of course, we are talking about the cervix, will release the alkaline mucus. Okay. So this alkaline mucus, the function is to attract the sperms or invite the sperms to come in. So during sexual intercourse, about uh, 300 million sperms uh, will gather at the posterior fornix. Um, if you can see this picture, here is the posterior fornix. Here is the uterus, right? Here it is the uterus. Here is the vagina. Okay, this one we call it anterior wall. This one is the posterior wall of the vagina. So at the end of the posterior walls, there is location, we call it posterior fornix. So during sexual intercourse, the sperms will be released by the male partner, of course, and will gather at the posterior fornix. So at this stage, about 300, during sexual intercourse, about 300 millions of sperms gather at the posterior phonics, lots of them. Um, the, the stronger sperms will travel, goes into the uterine cavity, but the less stronger one will be, the weak one will be killed by the acidic environment at the vagina. Acidic environment at the vagina here, lah, okay, will be destroyed by the acidic vagina, uh, vagina uh, acidic vaginal environment. And the stronger one will travel, go into the uterine cavity and further move to the fallopian tube or what we call it uterine tube, yeah? So um, they will meet the ovum at the ampulla. So after this, I'm going to show to you where's exactly ampulla. So ampulla is the first date, um, the first date place or dating place for the ovum and sperm to meet, right? So the spermatozoa that surrounds the ovum will produce hyaluronidase. So this one is the enzymes. The hyaluronidase is so important in order to break down the corona radiator. It's not coronavirus, yeah? Just now we have seen corona radiator. So this one is the corona radiator. So the hyaluronidase hormones is so important, uh, not hormone, the hyaluronidase enzymes is very important to break down the corona radiator. And the breakdown of the corona radiator will facilitate um, the penetration of the zona pellucida. That's the second layer of the ovum. So here is the zona pellucida. So first they break down the corona radiator and then they go in and then penetrate the zona pellucida layer. And then uh, at this time, only one sperm can attach to the zona pellucida, right? But the other sperms will be helping um, these sperms uh, to break down uh, the uh, corona radiator just now. So once the sperm attached to the zona pellucida, when the sperms attached to the ovum, then um, the, the membrane will be, uh, will be formed in order to protect uh, the, the fertilized or in order to protect the fusion between the ovum and sperm just now. This means 
once one sperm meet with one ovum, the other sperms will be left outside. So they no longer can attach to the seed ovum. And then um, this fusion between or the union between sperms and ovum will form a zygote. And after that, they will uh, continue to passage to the uterus okay, within three to four days. Uh, when they move towards the uterus, um, the cell will be uh, having cells division from two to four, from four. So they're going to enlarge. And later on, they will produce what we call morula. Um, and after that, we have fluid cavity inside the morula. We will call the cells now as blastocysts. And after that, the blastocysts will transform into the trophoblast and inner cell mass. And then in the end, the baby will be formed and then the placenta also will be formed. Yeah, so just now I already explained to you about the human fertilization process, right? So first of all, they, uh, they penetrate the or they break down the coronary radiator and they attach to the zona pellucida and one sperm attached to the ovum and the other sperms cannot come in, so they just stay outside there. Right, so um, remember just now the ovary release ovum, okay, and then the ovum uh, with the help of the um, what we call locomotive power by the uh, epithelium cells here. So the ovum will move, they will move, and then at the same time, the sperms released during the sexual intercourse, they also will come in and they will meet the ovum at the ampulla. So this one is the ampulla at the uterine tube. So uh, ampulla is the first place where the ovum and sperms meet together. So after that, they will travel, they will travel together. So now they already fused or they already united together and they're going to move together hand in hand. They work, they walk, walk, walk until they go to the uterus. So when they go to the uterus, they find a place, find a place to secure themselves, to secure in order to do that, they need to be implanted at the endometrium layer. This one is the endometrium layer that I already mentioned in the first lecture, just not in the first part just now. All right, so this place later on, they're not going to move to other place. This place later on going to be uh, growing up and becomes the placenta over there. So um, uh, the ovum sperm, this is the process, fertilization, zygote to morula, morula to blastocyst, blastocyst to trophoblast, and differentiated also to the inner cell mass. The trophoblast will form the placenta as well as the chorion. The inner cell mass will form the baby or the fetus and will form the amnion as well as the umbilical cord. Right, so the inner cell mass, we have three layers of the inner cell mass. We have in, in ectoderm, mesoderm, uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Yeah? So where is ectoderm? Ectoderm lies the amniotic sac. After this, I'm going to show to you where is the amniotic sac. So later on, the ectoderm layer of the inner cell mass going to develop the fetal skin, the hair of the baby, the nails, teeth, nervous system, and so on and so forth. And after that, the mesoderm is remainder of the tissue of the inner cell mass. This one will develop the muscles, let on transform to the circulatory system, uh, transform into the skeleton, um, excretory system, as well as the uh, gonad or sex organ. Nah? Um, the last one is the endoderm. Endoderm lines the yolk sac. After this, we're going to see where is the yolk sac. And then uh, this endoderm will form the digestive system, the respiratory tracts, the liver, pancreas, as well as urethra. Okay, so here is the amniotic cavity. Just now I talked about the amniotic sac and yolk sac. So now here is the amniotic cavity. You can see from here, uh, where is the amniotic cavity? This one is the yolk sac. You can see here, this one is the yolk sac. Uh, and this one is the amnion. Right, so this one is the chorion. Just now we've been talking about the trophoblast, right? Trophoblast going to develop the uh, the placenta and chorion. So this one is the chorion. Chorion is here, right? Okay. So the amniotic cavity. Where is the amniotic cavity just now? Um, where is that? Yeah, yeah, this cavity. Okay. 
So that's the amniotic cavity. It lies on site on the side of the ectoderm. It fills with the fluid gradually enlarged and pulls around the embryo and closes it. And this will form amnion from its lining. So that's the amniotic cavity. So now we see the amniotic sac. So here is the amniotic sac. So the amniotic sac lies in on site of the endoderm. It will provide the nutrients for the embryo until the trophoblast is uh, sufficiently developed to take over. So after that, the trophoblast, of course, will form the placenta. And after the after the birth, the yolk sac will be known as waterline duct. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here is the fetal development. I already mentioned to you just now about the zygote and then they will form into the embryo and embryo to the fetus. So normally after six weeks, uh, after uh, eight weeks, we, we will call the baby as fetus. So uh, the following are the markers during pregnancy. Normally at the 12 weeks of the pregnancy, the fetus will piece the entire uterus. Uh, during 14 weeks of the pregnancy, we can determine whether the baby is boy or girl. Okay, And then 16 to 20 weeks, uh, the mother can feel the first movement of the baby. This one we call it quickening. So quickening is the first movement of the baby that can be felt by the mother. Um, during 24 weeks of the pregnancy, at this time, if let's say the mother, um, the, the, the pregnancy is going to be terminated, the fetus now has uh, the higher chance to survive as, con as compared to the less than 24 weeks of the pregnancy. However, baby, if they being delivered before the maturity period, which is 37 weeks, normally their lungs is not yet matured. So when the lungs is not yet matured, the baby might have problems uh, in, in breathing. So therefore, premature baby, which is if they delivered before 37 weeks, they have the uh, tendency to have respiratory distress syndrome. So here you can see later on the fetal development um, week by week. Yeah, All right. So here is the time scale of the development development yeah so if you can see from this uh, slide yeah so here is the uh, the first uh, or the, the first when the ovum is released by the ovary and then here when the ovum is fertilized by the sperms and then the embryo will be developed after 8 weeks we call it as a fetus so um, this one is the week of the pregnancy, la, 0, 4, 8, 12. This one is the week of the pregnancy. So if let's say 40 weeks, this one we call it term. La, okay? uh, this one normally we call it EDD or expected date of delivery. So many mothers will give birth between 37 weeks to 40 weeks. La, but there is a certain mother who give birth before 37 weeks, what we call premature birth or premature uh, delivery yeah so after 40 weeks normally this one we call it as a post term so you can see from here this one is term post term after 40 weeks yeah right so just now we've been talking about the development of the baby so now we're going to move a little bit about development of the placenta so we know that a uh, one um uh, the union between the ovum and sperm, they will form zygote. Zygote will transform into morula. After that, it will transform to blastosis. After that, blastosis will transform into the uh, trophoblast. And trophoblast will form the placenta as well as the chorion. So chorion is the membrane that attached together with the placenta. Of course, um, this one for you, just nice to know, no need to remember. I just want to show to you there's a different uh, layers of the placenta known as coronic villi, chorion frondosum, chorion, uh, chorion leaf, and this one is the, the name, no need to remember that one. Um, just to show, this one is the bed of the placenta. Lah, yeah? So if you can, you can imagine, this one is the umbilical cord, so the baby is outside here. Yeah, the baby is here, yeah? so baby at this side, and this one at the endometrium layer of the uterus. Lah. Right, so this one, lots of blood. We need lots of blood vessels here in order in order to make sure that the placenta is really implanted or secured at the endometrium layer. 
So you can imagine after the birth, if this, um, this uh, what we call this placenta is going to separate from the endometrium layer, there will be lots of blood released by the mother. So that will come as a vaginal discharge after the birth, after the birth, lah. bleeding that the mother might have after the childbirth. Right, so this one is the structure of the placenta. If you can see just now, okay, I go once again to the previous slide. So here we call it fetal surface. Yeah, here we call it fetal surface. Why we call it fetal surface? Because the baby is here at this side. And this one we call it maternal surface. Why we call it maternal surface? Because it's facing the mother or it's facing at the uterus. So if you see in reality, so it's almost like this. Here is the fetal surface. Fetal surface is a bit like shiny in color, right? Shiny, and you can see the blood vessels here, and you can see the umbilical cord on top of it. And if you see, you turn the placenta, you see the maternal surface. You can, you can uh, observe these lobes. Uh, lobes we call it. Uh, the lobes one, two, three. You can call about sixteen to twenty lobes here, or eighteen to twenty lobes at the maternal surface. So it is red in color, right? So as compared to this one, it's quite bluish in color and you have the blood vessels for the fetal surface. But for the maternal surface, it is red in color. You can see the lobes between 18 to 20 lobes. You can count, you can count. So this one like a really dark red in color. Lah. Right, okay. So here is the real placenta. Okay, here's the real placenta. Remember just now I mentioned about the chorion. Here is the chorion. The chorion is the one who facing the facing the mother. And amnion is the one who facing the baby. I always ask, I always tell my students to remember A for anak. So amnion, I don't know whether you call baby anak also. So uh, you can call uh, amnion. So you remember amnion is the one who facing the anak or facing the baby, right? Okay, so what is different between amnion and chorion? So for, for amnion, it contains the amniotic fluid because it's facing the baby. It will provide the watery environment to, to the baby so that the baby can swim uh, properly inside the maternal uterus. Uh, and this amnion will protect the embryo or the baby from shock. And it will also prevent addition to the shells. And for the chorion is the outer membrane surrounding the other embryonic membrane and separate them from the environment. That one is for the maternal surface just now. So why do we need placenta? Placenta is important in order um, to allow the gas exchange uh, and the nutrients exchange, uh, the waste products from the baby, they want to transfer out. The, the waste product, they want to transfer out to the mother and those oxygen, they will bring in. So this placenta is very important in order to allow the exchange between the baby and the mother. And placenta also react or are responsible um, in providing the protective system to the baby. So it will protect the baby from fetal tissue rejection. And um, as I mentioned just now, placenta also release hormones uh, known as human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG, also release estrogen, progesterone, relaxin, as well as the HPL or human placenta lactogen. Right? That's the hormone released by the placenta. Can you see this one? Can you differentiate which one is the normal placenta and which one is the abnormal one? Can you tell me now which one is normal, which one is abnormal? Anyone can respond? Right. The right one? The right one, right one. yes, you are correct, sister. The right one is the normal and this one abnormal. Why do you think this one is abnormal? You can see there's a black clots over here, right? like an accessory for the placenta. These blood clots might be, um, might be quite uh, dangerous for the mother if let's say it, um, it remains in the uterus after the delivery, it can cause bleeding or hemorrhage after the delivery. So uh, this one is the normal one. This one is the ideal one or the common one. No? Right, so I finished with two um part now we're going to move a little bit to the culture should i continue or should i stop here 
Continue. Continue saja, Yesinta. Thank you, Yesinta, for your response. Um, so now we are going to move. I think I only have um, four or five slides regarding the culture in maternity nursing. So yeah, four topics regarding the culture in maternity nursing. We, we are going to talk a little bit about the belief regarding the importance of the children. We are going to talk a little bit about the belief and attitudes about the pregnancy and childbirth. We are going to talk a little bit about the health promotion practice during pregnancy, as well as regarding the cultural norms regarding the infant feeding and infant feeding, feeding practice. Yeah. Right. So talking about the children, um, I think now you can also, also tell me if you are talking with your boyfriend now, you might want to talk, okay, when we get married, how many baby do we want to have? Right. So, uh, but um, that's also couples where they feel fear uh, if they have more children, then this will affect their financial as well as their emotional resources or the financial status, right? Because they would say that if I get more baby, then I need uh, more babies, then I will need to give more money. I need to prepare more money for the baby when they grow up, they want to go to they want to go to school, they want to go to university, so I need to prepare more money. So some of them might say, okay, might not. Uh, therefore, we decide not to have so many babies so that we we, we have lots of money uh, remains with uh, something like that. Yeah. But um, uh, many cultures throughout the world, it is common to have as many children as possible. Um, I don't know the culture in, in over there in, in Indonesia, but in Malaysia, Perhaps in family, you in one family you might have five or seven siblings. How about, how about you over there? Maybe Novia can reply to me. Novia, how about your family? How many siblings you have? Novia, are you around? Three. Uh, three. Some someone said three. Um. Uh, three. How about others? Uh, Auladia. Auladia. I like to call my students. How about your family? How many siblings you have? Anyone want to respond? How many siblings you have in your family? I have two siblings. Seven. Did, did you say seven, Avinia? Did you say seven? Two, I said two. Oh, two, two only. Okay. So over there, you don't have so many, so much siblings. Eh? Also, my own, um, I'm the only child in the family, so only one. I don't have any siblings. And my son also didn't have any siblings. But there's culture who said that, um, yeah, we can have um, how many baby that we want. Uh, and this one is the destiny that Allah gives to us. Rizki, they said, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so it depends on the culture. So, um as a nurse, we need to understand the meaning of children and a cult in a culture, and this will uh, will explain their reaction towards whether or not they have they, they enjoy the pregnancy or they feel shame of the pregnancy. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, in Malaysia, if let's say you if you pregnant every year, then you feel a little bit embarrassed when you want to admit, oh, I'm pregnant again. Last year I just gave birth, so now I, I'm pregnant again. So a little bit shame to say that. Um, so um, that's also if you look at policy in China, I have one student from China, the PhD student from China, um, and, and she said there's a policy over there, and you might know also the policy in China, you need to only have one baby. So for those who want more than one baby, then perhaps it is not allowed. So for, for, for those family who prefer to have more babies, it's a little bit stressful for them not to have more than one baby. Nah? Right, so um, I guess our culture in Malaysia and Indonesia, we are almost the same where uh, in a Muslim culture perhaps, uh, but some, somehow there's also another religion who does not acknowledge the pregnancy that occurs outside the marriage. So in this culture, perhaps if the pregnancy um, occurs outside the marriage, the mother might be quite shameful of the pregnancy. They, they don't perhaps don't enjoy the pregnancy period as the other mother who, who get pregnant um, inside the marriage contract. Okay. Um, and there are also many culturally influenced beliefs related to the contraception. For example, uh, in, in Muslim culture, uh, there is no problem for us to take uh, pills to control the to control the childbirth or to control the pregnancy. Um, you can take um, uh, what we call uh, contraceptive pills. Uh, you can uh, use the device uh, to uh, what we call 
to plan your family. So once you are ready, then you can remove that device and then you can um, get pregnant again. But uh, again, in, in Muslim culture, there is a certain uh, contraceptive, contraceptive methods which is not allowed in a Muslim um, culture. For example, we don't allow the vasectomy. Okay, vasectomy is the removal of the what we call to what we call um, to make the man is unable to give birth, uh, not to give birth, unable to uh, contribute their sperms. Therefore, the partner is not going to pregnant lah. So vasectomy, for example, so that one is not allowed. Um, and we also talk about the bilateral tubal ligation, where we are going to cut the fallopian tubes, which means that the woman is no longer produced an ovum. So uh, that's that's mean that she cannot get pregnant anymore. So um, in certain cases, there might there might be some um, excuse and might be some uh, what we call them. Uh, um, we can allow to some condition, but in in general, that one is not um, encourageable um, in terms of the Muslim culture. Um, and belief and attitude about the pregnancy, belief and attitude about the pregnancy may also be culturally influenced and may influence the woman's health behavior. What does it mean? It means that um, how does the woman um, uh, perceive the pregnancy? Remember in the previous lecture, I have been talking regarding how certain culture, they accept pregnancy as the natural occurrence. It is not disease, it's state of well-being. Nothing can be done. I mean, uh, there is no need for them to go and check because they said, okay, this one is the natural occurrence. So, um, for example, in American of African descent, uh, descent they, they, they believe that pregnancy as a state of wellness, yeah, state of wellness, therefore they don't believe any antenatal care um, uh, to, to, uh, to be relevant uh, to their pregnancy. So although pregnancy is perceived as a natural occurrence in many cultures, but it also may be viewed as a time of increased vulnerability. That means uh, we are talking about COVID now. People say we are more uh, pregnant mother, perhaps more vulnerable to get COVID instead of compared to um, non-pregnant mother. So people always see pregnancy as a sensitive period or vulnerable period or uh, fragile. Okay? They are susceptible to certain types of infection for example. So um, in this case, they might want to go further and do their checking, follow up to make sure that th their pregnancy is okay and the baby is uh, growing up very well. And then individuals of many cultures take certain protective precautions based on uh, their belief. For example, I believe in our culture almost the same. Um, when I presented my, 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 my um, study, I remember last time to the uh, to the people from Africa, they will say, oh, your culture in Malaysia is not that different from us from uh, in, in Africa. So somehow there is some uh, similarities between um, us, between the Malaysian culture, Indonesian culture with uh, other part of the world, which is African. For example, in Malawi, people don't prepare the clothes early when they know they're pregnant at the early uh, stage. They don't prepare the clothes for the baby because they believe that if they prepare the clothes, they might get stillborn infant, which means that the infant might die inside the city. Uterus. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry for sorry for interrupting, but the time is up actually. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting, but oh so we only have one hour. Um, it's already one hour thirty minutes. Yeah, the yeah. How long how long do I have actually? One hour thirty minutes, but the rest is for oh. the discussion, the question and answer session. I see. And yeah. Okay. Okay. It's, it's similar with the previous uh, guest lecture. Right. Okay. The, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Answer, sorry. So, so I'm right, right. Really sorry for in interrupting you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's okay. Nothing much. Uh, nothing much important. I believe in the next slide you can read by your own. Um. Yeah. Only these slides. That's all. all so right. we can stop here. No worries. Oh, okay, so, all right, so I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we move to the discussion session. Mungkin ada yang mau bertanya, silakan satu atau dua pertanyaan. Fanny mau tanya, Bu. Ya, yeah, silakan. Ya. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask about the issues of pregnancy fertility. 
I've read an article about women whose body hair production is abnormal or more than they should be. Will this condition make it difficult for the woman to get pregnant? If so, is there a condition or a disease accompanying it? You. Uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't get this properly, sorry. Right. Can you repeat it again? Slowly, okay. slowly, slowly. I have read an article about women whose body hair production is abnormal or more okay, than... Sorry, sorry, what, 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 what is abnormal? The, the reproductive system is abnormal. The body hair production is abnormal. What is body hair? What, what is that? Oh, uh, wait. Fanny mau body hair maksudnya gimana? Uh, ini pertumbuhan bulu lebat itu loh, Bu. Uh, the, the growing of uh, feather in your skin? Yeah. Aha, okay, uh, okay. Your, your skin yeah. has feather and, and she has a, she's been asking about the growing, the growth of it. Right. Okay, okay. I, th I think I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and then uh, perhaps the condition that you refer to now is what we call PCOS the polycystic ovarian ovarian syndrome is that what you read PS, tentang PS, PS itu enggak bukan funny ya yeah, tentang PCOS itu ya yeah, yes, yes. okay. PCOS okay. right and, and your question whether or not she can get pregnant right <laughs> yeah uh, okay okay the answer is yes there is a possibility for the uh, for the girls with uh, PCOS to get pregnant uh, perhaps uh, it might take uh, i mean uh, to, to conceive, it might take uh, some time to conceive when after they get married, uh, to get pregnant, but uh, the chance is there. Um, I mean, uh, of course, now with the advanced technology, we have lots of, um, um, last week we learned about the IUI, we learned about the IVF, so we have the fertility technology that can uh, support the pregnancy even though the mother is not that fertile. But yes, PCOS, the mother can get pregnant, no problem to get pregnant. There's a chance to get pregnant. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Miss. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor City, for the answer. Um, can yang lain ada yang mau bertanya? Can Can we read the question from from the chat here? All right. Okay. Uh, Yusania. Okay, Yusania, we're asking about the. Oh, it's about the pregnancy. <laughs> Wait, I, I can understand. Let me read that. Ini bertanya berka, terkait oh, kandungan atau rahim oh, lemak. Okay, apabila kita menemukan ibu hamil dengan what, kandungan what lemak. Treatment, what is about the treatment? She has been asking about the treatment, what nurses should do. And then the food, also the activity that should be yeah. prevented from the pregnant woman. Okay, um, if let's say the mother get pregnant and then uh, what we call it, we call it, uh, there's a term, um, uh, cervical incompetence we call, uh, rahim lemah, the cervical incompetence, where it's supposed that the cervix is strong in order to support um, the, 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 what we call the pregnancy. But to some condition where the mother, the, the cervix of the mother is not that strong. That's the question that Sanya asked. So in this case, the mother will be uh, will be given the special treatment lah. In a case where the mother can be supported by using a ring, they can uh, put a ring inside the inside the what we call cervix at the cervical layer in order to support uh, the cervix cervical competence. We call so doing this insertion of this uh, ring will support uh, will support the cervix therefore we remains the pregnancy we remains the pregnancy until the end so that's one of the treatment that we can use uh, in terms of the food i'm i'm not that sure i don't know whether we have any food and I'm, I'm not sure we, whether we should take certain type of food in order to uh, to make uh, the cervix becomes more stronger I, I don't know. I don't know whether we, what food is that. Is, is that then, all the question? Uh, uh, and then she is just asking about the causes why women can have the rahim lemah is itself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is no specific causes for that one. There is no specific causes. It doesn't mean that if you are 
if you are older, perhaps yes. If you are older, perhaps it can be related to the cervical incompetence or if you are what we call uh, grand multigravida, which means that you already give birth many times and then you're pregnant for this time, yes. But I have seen a patient who are like second time pregnancy, also they already have the cervical incompetence. Okay, uh, yes. So uh, there, there's no absolute uh, causes for this one. This is multifactorial uh, causes for the spike incompetence. All right, is that all your answer? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much for the answer and thank you very much for the uh, knowledge you shared today. I hope that everybody here can understand and can get the benefit from your material today. So it's time to close the <laughs> guest lecture. Let's close our guest lecture today by saying Hamdala together. Yeah, I mean, so uh, similar with the previous guest lecture, which we will have the photo session for the documentation. So, Dr. Siti, could you please uh, stop to, to share the... Oh, okay, 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 okay. Right. Okay. All right. So, teman-teman, boleh dinyalakan um, fotonya. Kameranya maksudnya. Baik. Oke. Okay. Wait a minute. Right, so this is the first. Okay, okay, Doctor Siti, are you ready? <laughs> right, we're gonna take the first uh photo session. Okay, so satu, okay, so one, two, three. See all the cameras. Okay. Okay, the next slide. Right. Okay, one, two. Okay. Okay, the next one. And the last part. All right, Dr. Siti, all is well. Thank you very much for uh, your sharing. Thank you very much, everyone. So, may, may I confirm that for the next lecture, um, also the same, yeah? One and a half hour for lecture and half an hour for discussion. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So it's included with the question and answer. Right. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the Dr. Siti. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.